Our gospel reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Right then, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead to the other side of the lake while he dismissed the crowds. When he sent them away, he went up onto a mountain by himself to pray. Evening came and he was alone. Meanwhile, the boat, fighting a strong headwind, was being battered by the waves and was already far away from land. Very early in the morning, he came to his disciples walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost. They were so frightened, they screamed. Just then Jesus spoke to them, Be encouraged, encouraged. it's me, don't be afraid. Peter replied, Lord, if it's you, order me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. Then Peter got out of the boat and was walking on the water towards Jesus. But when Peter saw the strong wind, he became frightened and he began to sink. He shouted, Lord, rescue me. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him, saying, You are a man of weak faith. Why did you begin to have doubts? When they got into the boat, the wind settled down. Then those in the boat worshipped Jesus and said, You must be God's son. May God add God's blessing to the reading, the hearing, but most importantly, the living out of the scripture. Can we pray together? God, I think if we're all honest, there are times where we would say we have weak faith. But God, remind us that even when we are sinking, even when we are consumed with the winds and the storms around us, that you reach out. You reach out to grab us, that the grace of Jesus comes through the craziness. So God, open our eyes to what it is you're trying to say to us today. Open our hearts to how we can see and feel in his back being born in indiana you you essentially are given your fandom at birth and i have been a fan of the indiana pacers since reggie miller was our shooting guard and we had the dunking dutchman rick smiths when i was young i used to tell people i wanted to be seven four like rick smiths i uh, didn't quite hit that benchmark in fact, I have been so excited because my Pacers in the last week of play have won four out of five games, including one against the LA Lakers and LeBron James two nights ago. They have won specifically because TJ Warren, one of our, uh, for our, our forwards, has gone off on a tier of 30-point games. Now, for those of you who may not be NBA fans, a 30-point game is considered a great accomplishment. Usually only the best of the best can consistently get a 30-point game. LeBron James, Steph Curry, Michael Jordan. But not only that, uh, to get four out of five of your games and have them be 30-point games is what we call being hot or heating up. Being hot means that a player just can't miss. It's like when Steph Curry takes a shot from six feet beyond the three-point line and it sinks every time. Or a more dated uh, reference, when Michael Jordan would will his team to victory, ripping off streaks of consecutive points, sometimes without the help of the rest of his teammates. The term getting hot or heating up is so popular that it's made its way into basketball vernacular. You will hear announcers say, he's heating up, he's hot tonight. When someone is hot, they take shots that don't make any sense. Sometimes that's called throwing up a prayer because they just can't miss those shots. Or if a player is heating up and they take an ill-advised shot, we call that a heat check, just to see if they actually are in fact warming up and getting hot. This term doesn't just apply to basketball, but you hear it about pitchers and batters and baseball, sometimes about players in tennis. Serena Williams is usually heating up. Almost any sport, you have some element of heating up. As you might assume, as easily as someone might heat up, they can also cool down or get cold. The phenomenon where you can't make anything, even the easy shots. Every attempt rims out 
when you're hot, everyone wants to give you the ball to take the shot. And when you're cold, your teammates will intentionally keep you out of the play and the coach will draw up plays that keep you on the sideline. Cold shooters get benched. Cold pitchers get put down to the minor leagues. Cold batters get pulled from the rotation. I wonder if at times our faith can feel this way, hot and then cold. There may be moments where we feel an intense connection with God where everything is clicking, and there might be moments where we feel distant. Today, we have two stories about both hot and cold faith right next to each other in the same person. We have Elijah, who is fresh off a hot streak where he has discredited the prophets of Baal, a competing god, whose fears force him to hide in a cave because he feels that he is going to be next to be killed. We have Peter, whose faith sends him out of the boat into the raging waters, only to immediately sink because of his doubt. The story we read about Peter walking onto the water is one that we share often in church, and we usually end the message criticizing Peter for having doubted Jesus right there when Jesus is on the water. But I don't know if that's fair to the situation that's going on here. First, as our scripture told us today, Matthew says that the disciples are caught in a strong headwind. I'm going to confess that my experience as a sailor is very limited. I've got one funny story about sailing in Florida. I'll have to tell you sometime, but not today. So I asked one of our resident sailors, Ed Burke, about sailing. And he told me that it's not possible to sail straight into the wind, that you can go any direction you want except for the 70 degrees centered on where the wind is coming from. He compared it to being on a treadmill where you're fighting to stay still. You can run to stay in place or you can get pushed off. This inability to move, to move forward is dangerous because you really don't know where that wind could eventually take you. The current and the wind could take you anywhere. And if you're trying to get off of a dangerous spot, you could get pushed back into the rocks. So the disciples in this moment in scripture are fighting to stay afloat. I wonder if that phrase feels somehow relatable to us. They're fighting to stay afloat. They are in a life-threatening position. It's no wonder that they thought Jesus was a ghost. They themselves thought they were a hair's breadth away from death. I want to share a brief nugget of wisdom that Ed shared with me yesterday. He said, there are times sailing where you can't get where you want to. Just throw out the anchor and wait for conditions to change. There might be moments where we can't get where we want to. It's best just to throw out the anchor and wait for the conditions to change. The conditions were against the disciples in this moment. And convention would have had them do everything to just stay put and wait. But Peter acts on impulse. For a moment, he's inspired to get out of the boat and walk towards Jesus to step into the very elements that threaten his life. He exhibits incredible trust. And I don't know if we notice this, but we often ridicule Peter for doubting. He's outside the boat, and the 11 other followers of Jesus, Jesus' closest friends, are cowering in the boat. Jesus tells Peter, why did you doubt? The Greek word used here for doubt is diastasine, and it's only used one other place in the New Testament. It's used after Jesus is resurrected in Matthew. The, the direct translation of diastasine is having a double mind, having your mind divided. Peter is caught between his trust in Jesus who is on the water and his surroundings that are trying to drown him. I think if we look hard enough, we see a bit of ourselves in Peter. If we're honest, we often live with a divided mind between what being faithful means and what is going on around us. Have you watched the news recently and the storms raging in our world? Have you seen the winds and storms in your own life raging before you? To have a divided mind is to be human. Christ reaches out to Peter in his doubt, in his diastasine, in his double mind, and Christ reaches out to us in our double mind, because doubt is not the absence of genuine faith, but it is the struggle to live faithfully in a world that can often feel unfaithful to us. 
As theologian Friedrich Buechner says, doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. They keep faith awake and moving. So we are a United Methodist Church. I don't know if all of you know that. And United Methodism is founded by a man named John Wesley, who lived in the mid to late 1700s. Wesley had his own experience very similar to Peter's. Uh, young in his life, actually, when he was younger than, than, than myself, Wesley was called to be a pastor in Georgia. He was from England. At the time, Georgia was a colony. And as he was traveling to Georgia, Wesley was caught in a horrible storm in the Atlantic. In this moment, while the ship was battered and tossed about on the Atlantic waves, Wesley faced his potential death, and he began to doubt his faith in God. This is a man who's about to be sent to preach to hundreds, if not thousands, of people living in Georgia. And he is doubting his faith in God. He said of this moment that he had a fair summer religion. I imagine a fair summer day is probably what we've been experiencing recently. Not too hot, easy to walk around in. But when the storms raged, Wesley's faith went cold. It was lacking. Frightened by his doubt, Wesley asked a trusted mentor how in the world he could preach when his own faith was in question. And his friend said this, preach faith until you have it. And then because you have it, you will preach it. It kind of sounds like something uh, Jedi Master Yoda would say to Luke in the Star Wars movies. See, we often view faith as a possession, as something to be owned, as you either have it or you don't, you're either hot or you're cold. And we ascribe to spiritual giants like John Wesley, like Mother Teresa, like Peter or Paul, this inhuman ability to walk out in the middle of the storm. And we wish that we could just get our act together and stop wavering. But to be human is to act in faith despite the unsurety you may have to actively wait for faith to reveal itself to us, even when we're not sure if it's there. For Elijah, this revelation was silence. The direct translation of that sometimes is a thin whisper, but some scholars would say that what where Elijah heard God was in the silence. For Peter, it was that moment when he could stand on the waves and that moment when Christ had to reach out his hand. Our verse today from Romans is about salvation and faith. Often I've heard this verse used to determine who makes it in and who makes it out of God's book. Who, who qualifies, who has faith and who doesn't. Have you done the right things? Do you meet the criteria? But in the context of Paul's letter, this verse and these verses are a reminder of the closeness of faith. Paul is advocating for the accessibility of faith, specifically for him, for the Gentiles. See, in Paul's day, faith was often tied in ethnic or socioeconomic identity, and, or it was tied in ritual purity. So for Paul to say that the word of God is on your mouth, on your tongue, and in your heart is a radical idea, but he's quoting Deuteronomy. The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. Faith is in the words we speak. It's in our hearts as we desire to incline them towards Jesus. In Methodism, we actually understand it this way, that our faith opens us up to the forgiveness of Christ. That's justification. That when we make a decision to follow Jesus, we are forgiven. But that it doesn't end there. Faith is not just that moment of possessing that forgiveness. It's the journey we walk down the process of allowing our hearts to transform, to reflect Jesus' heart. Paul says in verse 10, trusting the heart leads to righteousness, and confessing with the mouth leads to salvation. Righteousness can mean that inclining of our hearts towards Jesus' heart. We speak faith. We feel faith in our hearts, and we act in faith like Peter or Elijah or Wesley. But life and faith is not some linear stepladder where you go from one, one rung to the next to the next. Faith is as near as life itself. It's, when, it's there when we're on the waves, and it's there when we're cowering in the boat. It's there when we're standing up to kings and queens, and when we're hiding in the cave. It's on the tip of our tongue. 
It's in the next step of the path in front of us. It's whispering to our heart, sometimes in silence. John Wesley's experience of doubt from his voyage to Georgia and back lasted a while, but he finally had a moment where his faith clicked, where he said, what, where he received what he got, what he called assurance. We call that his Aldersgate experience, where he was assured that in fact, Jesus did love and had died and had been risen again for him. But Wesley had doubts again in his life, as we all do. And that's why Wesley believed that faith can be something we step back from or step further into. Our faith doesn't begin and end in one moment, in one decision, but it's always ahead of us in some way. Good, bad, difficult, easy. So we're Methodists, and we are called Methodists because of how methodical our faith practices are. See, John Wesley, after his experience of doubt and throughout his life, laid out dozens of practices to help us continue to seek faith, to grow in faith, to be faithful, even when we don't feel faithful. And I'd like to share some of those with you, but I'm going to share them in terms of speaking, acting, and feeling faith. First, we speak faith when we share our life of faith with others. That can be sharing it with someone who doesn't believe in Jesus. That can be sharing it with a friend from this church or another church. That can be sharing the good and the exciting parts of your faith journey or the bad. Something about speaking it out is powerful. We speak faith when we remember the moments in our past where we felt God's presence particularly. Sometimes those are the anchors we hold on to when the storm is raging. We speak faith when we recite the creeds from our hymnal that have been part of the church for two millennia. We speak faith when we pray. Uh, famous author Anne Lamott says that the only three prayers you need are help, thanks, and wow. And even when we are questioning or doubting our faith, in some way there we are speaking faith. We act on our faith when we find ways to love God and love our neighbor, when we serve others in love, when we give of our time or our resources or our money or our heart to another person in grace. We speak, when we speak up for those who can't speak for themselves or when, we, or when we amplify voices of those who are being unheard, we are acting on faith. And we can do these things even if we're unable to speak about faith. Or even if we're not feeling very warm about our faith, we can still act faithfully. And I can't perfectly tell you how it is that you might feel your faith, how your desires or emotions might be turned towards God. But I know this, a key scripture for us reminds us that God is not just interested in your mind and your strength, but God is interested in your heart. John Wesley believed that faith was as much about experiencing changed hearts as anything else. Our hearts change when we long to seek God, when we desire to be more like Jesus, when we're working on feeling faithful. I want to paraphrase one of our St. Paul resident theologians again and say that sometimes being faithful is sitting and waiting like Elijah did until conditions improve for you to move forward faithfully. You see, our faith is not industrious. It doesn't require a return on investment. Yes, we're called to bear fruit, but our faith is a gift from God, meant to help us draw nearer to God and in time to join the work of God in the world where God is already bearing fruit that we can be a part of. So the funny thing about heating up in basketball is that mathematicians and scientists and statisticians have actually spent probably too many hours studying the phenomenon extensively and they have not found a way to explain why a player heats up or they can't tell you which player is going to heat up and they can't tell you when they're going to heat up it's just a moment where everything clicks and if you talk to any great NBA player or if you've watched any of the documentaries about Michael Jordan recently, I think you realize that they aren't concerned with whether they're heating up or cooling down. Most great players practice. They put in the effort and the work and they are consistent. And then they put themselves in the right place at the right time to take advantage of the hot hand. Maybe faith isn't about how on fire you are 
Maybe it's not about never sinking or never doubting. Maybe faith is about speaking and acting and guiding our hearts towards God. So when that opportunity to get out of the boat presents itself, we'll take the first step and let Jesus grab us even if we fail. Maybe faith is about guiding ourselves into the current of God running alongside us and knowing that God's grace is still there when we step away. Maybe faith is a companion along our journey to be closer to God rather than a possession, rather than a merit badge we wear in our religious life. Maybe faith isn't about how sure you are every moment of every day, but about walking with faith and trying to walk with God, whether you are sure or unsure. No matter how you find your faith today, take heart because Jesus is still there whether your faith feels hot or cold, close or distant. And take heart because God is still working and will still work through you. I was thinking about this sermon last night and realized that there is a scripture that talks about hot or cold in Revelation that we often quote. Uh, John of Patmos, who writes the book of Revelation, um, is writing to a church, I believe in Laodicea, and he says uh, that their faith is neither hot nor cold, but it is lukewarm. And I felt like I needed to speak to that a little bit um, because it could seem like maybe I'm trying to contradict that. When I read that, what I hear is that faith, when it is hot or cold, is still faith. But it's when we allow our faith to become apathetic, when we no longer care about our relationship with God or our relationship with others through God, that's when we're in danger. But if you find yourself in a place of doubt, in a place of fear, the good news is that Jesus' hand is still stretched out. And if you find yourself in a place where you are so excited about your faith, the good news is that Jesus' hand will continue to be stretched out when you eventually feel those moments of coldness. And the good news is also this, that our faith is ever-present, hoping to lead us back to God. Would you pray with me? So God, whatever our weeks have looked like, if we are coming in fully on fire and charged for you, if we are excited about this life we get to share with you, about your presence in our lives, or if our weeks have been difficult and we just want to cower in the boat, God, help us to remain faithful in the words we speak, in the things we do, and guide our hearts back to faithfulness in you. Remind us of the power of Jesus' love, of your love, the power of the Spirit that is constantly trying to draw us back. God, help us to choose you instead of the waves and the wind. And remind us that you overcome even those things to be near. God, help us to be your hand stretching out to those who are in difficult times. In Jesus' name, amen.